first of all, let me ask you, how many of you are familiar with machine learning? For example, how many of you have trained a model in your life? So yes, that's good. That's more than I expected. Um, OK, so to be clear, you don't need to be an AI expert to understand what I am going to talk about. Really, you don't need to understand all the things I will be saying. You just, just vibe with me, OK? <laughs> so um, for all of you working with multimedia, why should you care about AI models and efficiency? You know, AI is all the hype right now. You can all, uh, you all know, like, large language models, chat GPT, the diffusion models, all the generative AI. And these are remar remarkable achievements, and the AI progress is uh, stunning. So you can ask yourself, what's next? And I don't really know, but sometime AI is coming for multimedia. Uh, Real-time applications for computer vision uh, are becoming more popular, and a lot of cool stuff is going on. Mm. Let me go over for, uh, with some examples of uh, how um, real-time AI is already used for video processing. You all know this kind of face mesh and pose estimation from Snapchat, if you used it. Um, this, is, this, this is not a new technology. Um, you're probably familiar with um, segmentation models you know, from conference calls, if you ever used a green screen, virtual green screen on your Microsoft Teams or Google Meets, this is AI working in the background. Um, as well as your smartphone camera. There's a lot of AI magic going on that's responsible for your pictures looking this crisp and um, low light enhancement and this kind of stuff is... Um, like really working their way in the background of your smartphone cameras. Uh, there's uh, more examples. Uh, how many of you are familiar with this DLSS from NVIDIA? This is really cool. You can render a game at a lower resolution and upscale it using AI in real time. Turns out it's much more efficient. It's much faster than rendering in higher resolutions. And this allows you to do complex stuff like ray tracing, and then just upscale it, use the AI magic, right? Uh, there's also some generative tools. Another one from NVIDIA. Uh, this one makes your eyes, takes your eyes from your computer screen up to your camera, so your conference calls don't feel so awkward. Um, more is coming. You know, there's a lot of hardware support uh, being built in, in newer devices, like, um, newest notebooks or smartphones are equipped with tensor processing chips, basically AI computing chips, um, which in the near future will allow us to run bigger and stronger models uh, in real time. If you strip down a VR headset, uh, you're soon going to find some special AI chips too. So the tools and libraries for AI development are also maturing. Um, in the future, development of AI software will be much easier. And that's why you should care. In real-time applications, model efficiency matters quite a lot, obviously. Uh, that's not so obvious in scientific literature, where you can also often find that in papers, the focus is primarily on uh, scoring higher on benchmarks, not really at uh, making the model go faster, be applicable in real time. So let's go over some model metrics that you can find in scientific literature. Um, they often promise to reflect on its efficiency, but that's not always the case. You're probably all familiar with parameter count. If you've got a neural network, you have some weights and biases and other params that, if you count them, that's basically your model size. You know, large language models have a lot of parameters, hence the name. Uh, they, they're counted in billions or hundreds of billions. Typical CNNs, like computer vision neural networks, are not as big uh, with their parameter count ranging from hundreds 
of thousands to hundreds of millions. You don't really need to know all that, but this is just for reference to know what kind of values we're talking about. Uh, does parameter count matter? I have to spoiler, I guess it does. Uh, it, it's not crucial for efficiency, but you generally, the bigger the model, the better the accuracy. We, we all know that. If you had a lot of data, a lot of compute power, if you train a bigger model, it's going to do better. But it may not go as fast as you want it. Um, if you deploy on edge, meaning your smartphone or notebooks or your watch or whatever, uh, the network should be rather small to fit into memory. So while parameter count is not a great metric for efficiency, it does matter. Uh, and you should, uh, if you want your model to be efficient, you should keep it, keep it small. There are flops. Uh, floating point operations. Basically, how many operations you need to complete for the model to give you predictions. Um, not to be confused with flops, which is uh, floating point operations per second, uh, with a capital S. Uh, this is a measure of computational power. You may say that a GPU has a capability of uh, running 80 teraflops. Um, when we're talking about the model, uh, we use flops. Uh, <laughs> that's the total computations you need to, uh, to need to run. And it might be slightly better for measuring efficiency, since, you know, parameters can be shared between layers and they're not as good. Uh, you can see this chart right here, just for reference. More parameters usually translates to more flops and a lower error rate we don't really see the efficiency right here. You know, we care about, uh, oh, there's, there's max. Uh, max are multiply accumulate operations. They can be used instead of flops because uh, most of modern architectures, uh, CPUs or GPUs use FMA. This is fused multiply add operation. This is like a, one operation instead of two. So it's much more relevant to talk about max and when we're talking about machine learning models, because they use overwhelmingly, uh, rely overwhelmingly on uh, this multiply uh, accumulate operations. Roughly, you get twice as many flops as max. And they are sometimes confused. If you go over to original ResNet paper, like a uh, big paper, right? You, some of you may know it. How many of you know it? ResNet, nice. Uh, they uh, state their number of flops, but they really meant max. That's why uh, it's maybe kind of confusing. Still not good enough. Max, flops, and param count uh, can be useful uh, and can give you a hint about model speed, but they are indirect metrics for efficiency. Um, as you can see on this table right here, uh, the, the, this is a comparison of various model architectures. The correlations are much lower than we might anticipate. You know, the correlation between mobile latency and flops. Um, it's, it's even worse with parameter count. So why are they bad at predicting the speed of the model? Uh, let's find out. Now, let me bore you to death with some heavy machine learning stuff. Uh, let's go over some things that efficiency heavily depends upon, but the flops, smacks, and parent count don't take into the account. So, first one is memory access cost. Because if you count the operations, you don't really count how many memory access, um, you're, how, many how much time you're spending on memory access. Mm, so this should not be ignored during neural network design. Um, example right here. I know it may seem kind of complex, but you don't really need to get all it. Uh, this is a normal convolutional layer. It's used in neural networks or for computer vision. This one is depth-wise separable convolution layer. It's basically sparse version of the one on the right. 
it has uh, less connections, takes much less operations, and is famously used in um, mobile nets, uh, like the neural network architectures developed specifically for mobile CPUs. Um, with the same number of channels, we have three right here, it has much less flops, but the memory access cost is still there. Um, oftentimes you can find in papers that people scale up the number of channels because they, the number of flops is still really low, right? So it should be efficient, but it's not. It, it turns out it's actually much, much lower. So the memory access cost should not be ignored. Uh, right. Uh, another thing is skip connections. The skip connection is kind of the, this kind of building block that uh, ResNet neural networks are all about. Basically, you go uh, sequentially with the layers, but you add a second path to your data to run without obstacles. This makes your uh, information travel through your neural network without, uh, without obstacles, makes learning much more stable. It allows, basically allows your neural network to have many more layers than it would be possible without it. Um, this right here is even crazier. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, but you may, you may expect that um, it comes at the cost of memory. If we want to add this value of a tensor later on, we need to store a copy of it. Um, I'm not even talking about what, what's going on here, right? So while this may improve the accuracy of your network, uh, stabilize the training, it sucks during inference. It makes your model slow. Yeah, this one is a beautiful inception network uh, developed by Google a few years back. And we can see that it's made out of this kind of building blocks. Instead of one layer, we have a bunch of branches running through different kinds of conv convolutions. You don't need, you don't worry about it. Um, and we may guess that it's going hard on the memory, right? Uh, there's one thing that, um, one more reason why it was it, why it's slow, especially in GPUs. Uh, it's the degree of parallelism. Basically, if you have a one big task, it's much easier to parallelize than if you had a bunch of smaller different tasks. GPUs are great at parallelizing computation, but there's one thing they hate, and that's synchronization. This thing forces the GPU to synchronize. That's why it's mad at, at this kind of architectures. So if we want to make our models faster, we should try to avoid this branching, this complex um, kind of patterns. We should keep it simple. Um, and obviously, there's platform characteristics. Um, you can't expect a neural network to behave the same way on CPU, on a GPU, mobile GPU, TPU, or whatever. Operations with the same number of flops um, could have different running time depending on your platform. Oftentimes, low-level libraries like QDNN on NVIDIA cards um, will be specially optimized for common operations like three by three convolutions. Uh, and this basically uh, makes predicting runtime speed really hard, because you don't know how, what's optimized, to what extent. So what are the conclusions for this, or guidelines for you to either design or pick the right model? Uh, the most important one is latency and throughput are the only reliable metrics. You, if, you, if you're an ML engineer and you design a model architecture, or you are a software engineer browsing through the models, comparing them, um, if you care about efficiency, you should measure the latency or throughput on your target platform, because that's like the only 
uh, reliable way to do it. This is like the most important conclusion here. Um, but I have other guidelines. Oh, so uh, I talked about model being um, that, that it's better to keep your model simple. While the branching and the complex uh, skip connections can make the training smoother, it makes a model slower. Well, you can have your cake and eat it too. There's this trick called, called reparameterization. You can have a bunch of branches with convolutions and batch normalizations and tensor additions. These are all linear operations. So you can transform them, fuse them into mathematically equivalent single convolutional layer. So you train this kind of network, and then you calculate the equivalent network like this one on the right. This one, the training goes smoothly, and it's like, you can see that the green line is lower than the blue line. <laughs> and the, I don't know if you can see from all the back uh, here. So uh, the blue line is the same network, but without those additional branches. Um, the train loss, meaning the error rate, uh, is much lower for the network with those blocks that are reparameterizable. Right, that's a hard word. Uh, and during deployment, you just cut, cut it all out and leave it in a simple form. Um, another one, it's like, don't use models way too big for the use case. Uh, you don't need to overextend yourself for the few percent more accuracy. You still want your model to be small and efficient. That's often more important than keeping the, or the keep using the, the best solutions with the best scores on the market. Um, but if you want to make a model smaller, you can use something like knowledge distillation. This is a technique to train the smaller neural network more effectively. If you have a bigger neural network, you can use it, you can, you can employ it as a teacher for the smaller network. This way of training allows the student network, this one, to learn much better than it would by all by itself. Um, sometimes it can match your bigger network's uh, stats in terms of performance while being much more efficient. So this one is important to keep in mind. Also, don't forget to quantize. You basically, if you have a model with single precision floating points uh, as weights, you know, 32 bits per weight, uh, you can scale it down to half precision. Usually it does not cost you any uh, performance degradation. It works just as, as it did before, but it's kind of faster, you know? Uh, also, the network weighs much less. You can go a few steps further and use 8-bit integers to represent those weights. Uh, that's the, the, you know, uh, those integers correspond to the weights. That's why it's called quantization. Uh, hence the name. And lastly, check out these tools. Uh, I know they are pain in the ass to work with, but they can do some real magic under the hood and optimize your model runtime significantly and fit it for the device you're deploying onto, like um, TensorRT for NVIDIA GPUs, TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow Lite or PyTorch Mobile for smartphones or, mo or mobile devices, Onyx, or whatever you actually wanted to, yeah, like your browser or stuff. So check them out, and that's all for today. Do you have any questions? All right, so uh, last portion of, of questions before the coffee break. Um, who would like to ask uh, Wojtek a question? I went too hard, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
since there are no questions, I'm just going to share a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I used to work at a startup, well-funded startup, with a, a leader, whoever, who was like, let's say, in love with AI and machine learning, but not necessarily an expert, okay? But he could get the money. And we were solving an interesting problem, which is that um, in retail, when people are buying like fruits and vegetables, on a large scale, they go rotten. A lot, and a lot of it is thrown away. And this guy employed 10, 12, something like that, machine learning guys, to create this super complicated model to predict you know, when's the right time to buy something. After about a half a year of experimentation, maybe even more, we found out uh, the perfect model. It was called linear regression, and that's it. End of story. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, are there any questions or funny stories to share? <laughs> Okay, so let's give another round of applause for Wojtek. Um, thank you.